research cross state in you. Today, Dr. Zhang Kutie at the University of Strasbourg Institute for Advanced Study in France will give a presentation on the topic Communist Party or Working Class Party, Marx's two theories of the party. The presentation time will be one hour, followed by 30 minutes of floor discussion. Dr. Kutie, please let us hear your talk. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for your invitation. I am really happy and proud to be here today. Um, well, I'll talk about um, the, the topic of my PhD, which is uh, Marx's theory of the party. And uh, the title of my presentation, uh, as uh, well, has just been said, is uh, Communist Party or Working Class Party, Marx's Two Theories of uh, the Party. Uh, the theory of the party is uh, often regarded as a blind spot in Marx's work. In some ways, uh, his entire political conception brings us back to this question, since uh, the revolutionary strategy which he develops seems unthinkable without the um, collective agent constituted by uh, the organized proletariat. However, in the absence of a text uh, which would contain a systematic presentation of Marx's theory of the party, uh, the latter regularly appeared as underdeveloped or even non-existent. During the 20th century, uh, it was customary among Marxists to refer to Lenin as a theoretician of the party, not only because uh, the author of What is to be Done was regarded as the architect of a party of a new type, but also because Marx's reflections on this question were seldom considered as the major source of inspiration. Uh, the Marxist-Leninist Vulgate uh, intended to explain this situation by bringing Marx back to the limits of his own time. Uh, in the foundations of Leninism, for instance, Stalin said that Marx lived in a pre-revolutionary period in which, quote, the party never had nor could have that great and decisive importance which it acquired afterwards under conditions of open revolutionary clashes, uh, end of quote. Um, directly and indirectly, this interpretation undeniably left its mark on later researches into Marx's political thought. To the alleged underdevelopment of uh, Marx's theory of the party corresponds a real underdevelopment of secondary literature. Among the rare studies which focus on this question, it has to be noticed that the main material of the analysis is very often made up of texts written in the 1840s and especially the manifesto of the Communist Party. And when these studies try to take into account the entirety of Marx's work, coherence predominates, which lends wheat to the unquestioned hypothesis of a global continuity. However, such an interpretation is not of no consequence. In some respects, it hinders from taking into consideration Marx's political activity in the two last decades of his life, which is attested as well in his role inside the General Council of the IWMA as in his correspondence with the leaders of the young German social democracy. This interpretation unwillingly prevents from regarding Marx's political activity as something more than an implementation of theoretical principles already drawn up before. The analysis of the different sources 
shows nevertheless that it is not the case. Far from being set at the end of the 1840s, Marx's theory of the party comes to its full development in the new situation of the 1860s in the context of the emergence of much more massive workers' organizations in Europe. Furthermore, Marx drew up his reflections inside these organizations and not outside them. Admittedly, Marx never explicitly mentioned the existence of a rift between his first theory of the party developed at the end of the 1840s and the conception which he worked out 20 years later at the end of the 1860s. But signs of this seldom noticed conception, uh, sorry, of this seldom noticed discontinuity are not lacking. Indeed, uh, the decisive thesis expounded in the manifesto of the Communist Party, that of a Communist Party envisaged as an enlightened part of a broader working class party, this decisive thesis disappears from Marx's strategic horizon in the 1860s. It steps aside in favor of a reflection centered around the construction of the class party in which the mere idea of a distinction between a working class party and a communist party becomes meaningless. There is no question anymore of constituting organizations on an ideological basis, which would essentially refer to the content of projects to be implemented in order to establish the society of the future. Against this ambition, which relates back to the paradigm of the sect, Marx rather tries to outline the conditions of possibility of an autonomous political activity of the working class. Most of the commentaries on Marx's theory of the party refer to the famous, the famous pages at the beginning of the second section of the manifesto of the Communist Party. Um, so you, you, you see it now, I think. Uh, um, which uh, is uh, in view of the later reception of this book. In this passage, um, in this passage, indeed, is clearly broader working class party from which it can only be distinguished by its resolution and perceptiveness. I, I quote, uh, you see it on, on the screen, the communists therefore are on, oh, you, you, you can't hear me well. Okay, can you hear me well now or is it yes, okay? Now, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, the, the, the communists, therefore, are on the one hand practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country, that section which pushes forward all others. On the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the conditions and the ultimate and general results of the proletarian movement. You can see the uh, the original text in German uh, below if you if you want. Uh, however, uh, it matters that we, we cannot hear you. Okay, sorry. I, I think there's a problem with my. Uh, now it's okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, it's big because the, my paper was uh, on, on the right of my computer. So I think uh, 
I, I looked on the wrong uh, on the wrong direct in the wrong direction. Okay, uh, sorry for this problem. Um, so, uh, however, if the manifesto undoubtedly constitutes a crucial moment, it matters that the position this text holds in Marx's analysis be connected to the reflection to the reflections he had developed before and will develop afterwards. On the one hand, the modeling outlined in the manifesto itself has to be regarded as the outcome of an elaboration process set up since the middle of the 1840s, which it is instructive to recount. On the other hand, this modeling shall not be seen as definitive and has to be compared with Marx's later assertions. Uh, Marx begins to develop a reflection on the modalities of organization of the revolutionary movement in 1846, when the Communist Correspondence Committee is created in Brussels. Um, the, the syntag Communist Party itself appears in the German ideology on the occasion of the confrontation with true socialism. So uh, now you see another, uh, another text uh, from the German ideology uh, against what they regard as a merely literary movement Marx and Engels intend to promote the connection between communism and working class movement. You can see it in this text uh, from the German ideology. Even the social movement was at first a merely literary one because of the lack of real passionate practical party struggles in Germany. True socialism is a perfect example of a social literary movement that has come into being without any real party interests. And now, after the formation of the Communist Party, it intends to persist in spite of it. It is obvious that since the appearance of a real Communist Party in Germany, the public of the true socialists will be more and more limited to the petty bourgeoisie and the sterile and broken down literati who represent So from this time, the reference to the actually existing Communist Party becomes criterion by which the different political positionings can be assessed, not only by the yardstick of their ideological content, but first and foremost, in relation to their reception among the proletariat. You have another, uh, another text here from the German ideology. Here we have, on the one hand, the actually existing Communist Party in France with its literature, and on the other hand, a few German pseudo scholars who are trying to comprehend the idea of this literature philosophically. Nevertheless, Marx really came to precise the outlines of this connection between communist discourse and mobilization of the working class only from 1847, when he became a member of the League of the Just. Joining an organization which would soon be renamed Communist League could not fail to lend to this problem a very tangible significance. However, Marx's attempts to grasp this connection were not unequivocal at that time. Indeed, Marx tries to think two different questions conjointly. On the one hand, that of the constitution of the working class in a political party. On the other hand, that of the constitution of the communist party as such. From this point of view, it can be considered that the efforts of theoretical elaboration held by Marx in 1847 comes close to being a strategic clarification of the relationship 
between two distinct forms of organization. Working class party on the one hand, communist party on the other hand. Though not explicitly expressed, this duality is already underlying in the poverty of philosophy. Um, in the poverty of philosophy. Indeed, the fifth part of the second chapter devoted to strikes and combinations of workers in which Marx develops a genuine uh, theory of organized forms of proletarian struggle results in the analysis of the constitution of the working class in a political party which cannot be likened to a communist party. The case of Britain, taken by Marx as example, is a sure sign of it. The large political party created by the English proletariat in the wake of strikes and trade unions is Chartism, a movement which definitely cannot be regarded as communist. Can see it uh, on the text um, on 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 the screen. The organization of these strikes, combinations, and trade unions went on simultaneously with the political struggles of the workers, who now constitute a large political party under the name of Chartists. From this point of view, the birth of the working class party only represents one part of the way to go, precisely because a working class party is not necessarily communist. Theorizing about the connection between working class party and communist party amounts to highlighting the conditions ensuring to move on to the next stage. Besides, this problem was centered by Engels a few years earlier when he analyzed re the relationship between Chartism and Owenism in the condition of the working class in England. Engels regarded the union of socialism with Chartism as a new departure of Chartism because the working class character of uh, Chartism was not enough to make it into a communist party. So you, you can see it on, on the screen. Um, the union of socialism with Chartism, the reproduction of French communism in an English manner will be the next step and has already begun. The only when this, then only when this has been achieved Will the working class be the true intellectual leader of England? Meanwhile, political and social development will proceed and will foster this new party, this new departure of Chartism. Despite the relative terminological undifferentiation which characterizes the analysis developed in the poverty of philosophy, it might be said that it involves recourse to the distinction between working class party and communist party. A few months later, in the series of articles published between September and November 1847 in the Deutsche Brüsseler Zeitung, this distinction appears, though in a faltering way. Explicitation delivered in the article called The Communism of the Rheinischer Beobachter, dated September 12, consists in presenting the constitution of the Communist Party and the constitution of the working class parties as two congruent but not identical phenomena whose junction could only be performed gradually in the course of time and variously in the different countries. In countries ruled by the bourgeoisie, a general historical process would be at work through which the proletariat acquiring, quote, 
the status of a recognized party would be more and more adhering to the communist party you can see it on the on the text on the screen to this to this end it only has to compare the political position of the proletariat in england france and america with that in germany to see that the rule of the bourgeoisie does not only place quite new weapons in the hands of the proletariat for the struggle against the bourgeoisie but that it also secures for it a quite different status the status of a recognized party does the Herr Consistorial Councillor then believe that the proletariat, which is more and more adhering to the Communist Party, that the proletariat will be incapable of, utiliz of utilizing the freedom of the press and the freedom of association? So, uh, speaking about an adhesion, uh, as Marx uh, does here, uh, implies a bit implicitly the existence of an initial exteriority between both parties. Besides, it can be observed that this couple of notions reappears a few weeks later in the series of articles called Moralizing Criticism and Critical Morality. There again, equivocally, in this text, Marx intends to show that countries where econ economical exploitation appears as untied from political inequality provide a fertile breeding ground for the working class to form a political party, as can be seen from the examples of the Chartists in England and from that of national reformers in the United States. You can see it in the in the text, just as in England, the workers form a political party under the name of the Chartists, so do the workers in North America under the name of the national reformers, and their battle cry is not at all rule of the princes or the republic, but rule of the working class or the rule of the bourgeois class. But on the other side, Marx emphasizes that the emergence of a communist party dates back to long before the emergence of the working class parties. It takes place during the bourgeois revolution, not after it, as can be seen from the example of the French Babovists described as, you can see it now, described as the first manifestation of a truly active communist party or from the example of the english levelers in the uh, 1640s uh, you, you see it from from the text uh, moralizing criticism and critical morality from 1847 the first manifestation of a truly active communist party is contained within the bourgeois revolution at the moment when the constitutional monarchy is eliminated. Adding to the exteriority mentioned in the communism of the Rheinische Beobachter, the idea of a chronological gap inside the constitution process of both parties Marx tries to grasp the specific problems of the connection between them without settling it clearly. Therefore, the successive attempts of the year 1847 still constitute in many respects exploratory reflections rather than conclusive answers. The manifesto of the Communist Party is the first occurrence of a precise modeling of the relationship between working class party and communist party. However, this modeling partly relies on milestones set by Engels a few months earlier in the principles of communism. In the principles of communism. This preliminary version of the guidelines of the Communist League, written between October and November 1847, already contains reflections about the attitude of the Communist Party 
towards the other political parties of our day, Chartists and national reformers in the United States, repeatedly described as paradigmatic examples of working class parties. And you, you will see it on the, on, on the text. In England, France, and Belgium, where the bourgeoisie rules, the communists still have for the time being a common interest with the various democratic parties, which is all the greater the more in the socialist measure. They are now everywhere advocating the Democrats approach the aims of the communists, that is, the more clearly and definitely they uphold the interest of the proletariat and the more they rely on the proletariat. From this point of view, Communist Party and Working Class Party could not be regarded as a rival organization, but rather as complementary forms of organization. Therefore, communists were called to make we're called on to make common cause, um, to make common cause with the working class parties. And if the concrete terms of this alliance were not expounded in detail, it already appeared clearly that it was not contingent choice, but on the contrary, the core of the strategy which the Communist Party had to follow. If the elements outlined in the principles of communism can be considered as the framework in which Marx and Engels developed their conception of the relationship between communist party and working class party in the manifesto, there is still a qualitative break between both texts. Indeed, it is only in the version of 1848 that the specific examples put forward to explain the nature of this relationship are actually deduced from explicit principles. On this account, if Marx and Engels claim in the fourth section of the manifesto that the, the position of the Communist Party is already clear, it does not mean that such a position would not require an explanation. On the contrary, this assertion intends to show that, unlike the position of the Communist Party towards the opposition's party, which are not working class parties, the position of the Communist Party towards the working class parties directly results from the conception of the relationship between proletarians and communists described in the second section of the manifesto. Contrary to the variability of the alliances which communists may conclude with progressive movements in different countries, and which rely on a strategic analysis of the context, the relationship between communists and working class parties has to be a permanent feature related to the very essence of the communist party. The modeling outlined in the second section of the manifesto, according to which the communists do not form a separate party opposed to other working class parties, admittedly constitutes a strong assertion, but remains problematic in its phrasing. From this point of view, it is hardly surprising that such an assertion could be interpreted very differently sometimes leading to partial or complete deconstruction of the con concept of communist party. Nevertheless, it seems possible to take its enigmatic character away, provided, provided it is not disregarded that it takes place in a text called Manifesto of the Communist Party, which is a direct expression of a structured political organization called the Communist League. Despite the ambiguity of the word party in Marx's and Engels' mind at the beginning of, the, of 1848, attempts to separate markedly the Communist Party mentioned in the manifesto from the Communist League itself appear excessive. The Communist Party, whose positioning is here described, is neither a broader nor a smaller cycle than the League 
It simply names what the League restructured on the occasion of the two Congresses of 1847 is destined to be. For this reason, the main difficulty of the text does not lie in the connection between party and league, but rather in the connection between communist party and existing working class parties. Indeed, what requires an explanation so that the assertion does not appear to be contradictory is the theory of the non-particularity of the communist party. This theory is only comprehensible with the provision that this non-particularity is not synonymous with indistinction or with mere assimilation to the existing working class parties. This non-particularity rather refers to the non-separation which is characteristic of the action of the communist party towards the working class parties. If this non-separation cannot simply be seen as indistinction, it is because the relationship between communist party and working class parties is that of a part towards the wall. Therefore, the answer to the mystery is stated a few lines below when Marx and Engels explain that the communists are the most advanced and the most resolute section, most advanced and the most resolute section of the working class parties of every country. Communist party and working class party are concentric circles. The communist party is a party inside the party. Like the fraternal Democrats, inside the Chartist movement in England. The connection between them is as, is as political as organizational, even if the practical modalities of its fulfillment are not clearly specified and remained and remain dependent on the structuring level reached by the working class party itself. Despite a few adjustments, this conception will remain the thread of Marxist political strategy in the Communist League until autumn 1850 at least. However, the dissolution of the organization and the period of isolation that followed led him to restructure his own theory of the party significantly. Therefore, it seems necessary to stand the continuistic interpretation on its head, interpretation according to which transformations performed by Marx from the middle of the 1860s would be mere outcomes of the general principles developed two decades before. Admittedly, this interpretation can claim to follow Engels's assertion in his letter to Gerson Trier uh, of December the 18th of 1889. Indeed, in this text, Engels maintains that the core of Marx's theory of the party would have remained unchanged since 1847. You can see it on the screen. If the proletariat is to be strong enough to win on the crucial day, it is essential, and Marx and I have been advocating this ever since 1847, for it to constitute a party in its own right, distinct from and opposed to all the rest, one that is conscious of itself as a class party. However, uh, paying attention to the way Engels presents in this very letter, the fundamental principle on which this theory relies, there are some reasons to wonder if this assertion is not based on a retrospective illusion. Engels stresses the need to constitute a party in its own right, distant from and opposed to all the rest, one that is conscious of itself as a class party. 
such an assertion is somewhat surprising. In many respects, even in the, in the choice of adjectives, this sentence seems to say the opposite of the conception of the Communist Party outlined in the manifesto. Indeed, in 1848, Marx and Engels claim that the communists do not form a separate party, keine besondere Partei, opposed to the to overworking class parties. Four decades later, on the contrary, Engels put this emphasis on the constitution of a party in its own right. In German, eine besondere Partei. Keine besondere Partei, eine besondere Partei. Two further apart points of view are hardly imaginable. Why the manifesto laid stress on the non-particularity and the non-separation of the Communist Party, the letter to Gerson Trier of December 18, 1889, promotes exactly opposite characteristics. We are inclined to think that a significant shift occurred between both texts. If so, it is necessary to answer the two questions which inevitably follow from this, from this assessment. On the one hand, what does this shift exactly consist in? On the other hand, how can we explain that this shift went unnoticed even by Engels himself, who seems to have seen nothing but continuity. The clincher which would enable to solve the problem is all the more difficult to identify because it was never explicitly dealt with by Marx. Admittedly, it can be read between the lines and different speeches made by, Mar by Marx from the end of the 1860s, but it was never expounded as such. This clincher is the abandonment of the strategy of the party inside the party, which constituted the thread of the manifesto. It was, it was this perspective which gave to the theory of the non-particularity and the non-separation of the Communist Party its full meaning, because the Communist Party was directly dependent from the working class parties as broader organizations. Now, that is precisely this point which accounts for the shift surreptitiously performed in Marx's conception at the end of the 1860s. This duality between communist party and working class party is put aside in favor of a reflection on the class party combining the question of the working class organization and that of the promotion of communist ideas. Henceforth, the communist party is not regarded anymore as a section of the working class party and even disappears in some ways from Marx's strategic outlook. At the very most, it can still be envisaged as what the working class party itself is destined to become at the end of a political clarification process. Such a shift is of course not without consequences concerning the modalities of the communist intervention in the working class movement. Contrary to the situation of the end of the 1840s, there is no talk anymore of constituting a specific organization in the style of the Communist League. Precisely because the self-organization of the proletariat gathers space from the middle of the 1860s, Marx tries to promote the development of the working class parties themselves without expecting from them that they declare themselves communist. Because of that, the claim to particularity and separation of the party outlined in Engels's letter to Gerson Trier of December 18th, 1889, has to be understood differently from its refusal in the manifesto. In 1848, the point was to assert the non-particularity and the non-separation of the Communist Party towards the, the working class party. 
this distinction relying on the existence of two different kinds of organizations, the first one being like a part of the second one, loses all relevance once the central question becomes how to reinforce the working class parties themselves. The particularity and the separation mentioned in 1889 refer to a party which is conscious of itself as a class party, interpreted as a synthesis of the working class party and the communist party in the sense that the manifesto gave to these two concepts. Therefore, these characteristics take on their full meaning with regard to the rest of the existing parties, which, despite the opposition function they are likely to fulfill, do not stand as representatives and offshoot of the working class. Consequently, it is quite understandable that Engels considered that, despite this major shift, there was a fundamental continuity in Marx's theory of the party since the 1840s. From this period onwards, indeed, the question of the autonomy of the working class organization towards the over opposition parties held a high position in his reflection. However, the issue of the working class organization and that of the communist organization did not blend together until the middle of the 1860s. In this regard, everything leads us to believe that the London Conference of the IWMA of 1871 the resolution of 1871 played a major role in the formalization of this new conception since it is in the resolution number nine, adopted on this occasion and mainly written by Marx and Engels that the necessity for the proletariat to constitute itself into, quote, a political party distant from and opposed to all old parties formed by the property classes is expressed in a much clearer way than before. I will not read the, the whole text, but you, you can see the, the first line considering that against this collective power of the property classes, the working class cannot act as a class except by constituting itself into a political party distant from and opposed to all, all parties formed by the property classes. In some respects, Engels's letter to Gerson Trier of December 18, 1889 only recapitulates the conclusions stated on this occasion in um, in September 1871 in London. The reconsideration of the model of the double structure at the end of the 1840s coincides with the development of a more systematic reflection about another couple of concepts, party and sect. In the new situation of the middle of the 1860s, the emphasis on the gap between sound and pathological forms of organization gains priority with regard to the counterproductive and damnable practices promoted by figures like Ferdinand Lassalle and Mikhail Bakunin. De facto, the very idea of constituting a specific political organization trying to push forward the real or alleged accuracy of a doctrine in front of the general dynamics of the working class movement becomes, in Marx's eyes, the most certain sign of a sectarian practice. In this regard, the political line of the general German Workers' Association in the second half of the 1860s constitutes a paradigmatic example. Pointing out the intrinsic limits of La Salle's undertaking, Marx maintains in his letter to Johann Baptist von Schweitzer of October the 13th of 1868 
that, quote, the sect seeks its raison d'être and its point d'honneur, not in what it has in common with the class movement, but in particular, shibboleth distinguishing it from that movement. The characteristic of the sect is to appeal only to a public of initiated persons instead of promoting unity of the working class. The sect lays down doctrinal recipes as preconditions for action, describing them as, quote, a panacea for the sufferings of the masses. You can see it on the screen in the letter to uh, Johann Baptist von Schweitzer. From this point of view, uh, rejecting sectarianism directly implies, in Marx's eyes, refusal of an organization exclusively based on a doctrine. The working class party is destined to unite the members of a class rather than the followers of a strictly defined theory. This perspective is clearly expounded in the pamphlet of March 1872 called uh, Fictitious Splits in the International. In this text, uh, Marx and Engels compare the sectarian organization with their vagaries and revolveries to the IWMA described as a genuine and militant organization of the proletarian class, whose rules only present a general outline of the proletarian movement. This assertion does not mean that the program of a working class party would be doomed to remain vague and has he in order to integrate as many currents of opinion as possible. It rather means that the theoretical elaboration of this program cannot be entrusted to the self-proclaimed leader of a sect, but has to be performed in the practical struggle through the exchange of ideas in the section. I won't read uh, the, the whole text because uh, I, I don't want to uh, waste time. Uh, in this respect, it is not surprise that at the beginning of the 1870s, Marx strained every nerve to reject the use of any term which would be explicitly referred to a doctrine by way of name for the, the different intern organizations of the IWMA. In this context, the London Conference of September 1871 adopted the resolution number 23, which is also integrated uh, in the point number 53 of the administrative regulations of the IWMA, according to which, quote, no branches, sections, or group will henceforth be allowed to designate themselves them, themselves by sectarian names. Uh, this measure is notably the result of a discussion raised in the General Council of the IWMA in spring 1870, following the admission request received from the Cercle des Proletaires Positivistes de Paris. Um, during the the meeting of March uh, 18, uh, of March the, the 15th uh, of 1870, during which the, the request was examined, Marx pronounced himself against the admission, pointing to the fact that the rules of this circle were, quote, too exclusive and contrary to the general rules of the association urging that there was no reason to get organized on a doctrinal basis, Marx opposed their admissions as positivists, however many qualities they may have singly. Referring back to this discussion in his letter to Engels of March 19, 1870, 
Marx introduced a distinction between philosophical society and workers' society. A philosophical theory, whichever it is, cannot constitute an appropriate basis for a working class party. The sole reason which could justify the admission of the members of the Cercle des Proletaires Positivistes de Paris was, in Marx's eyes, their class belonging. That is why it was possible to admit them as a simple branch of the IWMA, but not, however, as branche positiviste. A few weeks later, Marx was led to go in greater depth into the question of the relationship between organization on a doctrinaire basis and sectarian practice on the occasion of a discussion about the mandate given to Henri Verlet in the middle of April 1870 to reorganize the IWMA in Paris. Indeed, Verlet was not only a blankest activist, but also one of the editors of the weekly newspaper, La Libre Pensée. Afraid Verlet might try to restructure the new section of the IWMA on the basis of mainly philosophical principles, in these cases of uh, rationalist materialism, but the exact nature of this principle does not really matter. Marx had advised Paul Lafargue in a letter which I will show you, this letter of April 18th, uh, 1870, to prevent him from giving to the new organization a sectarian name. But the most interesting and at first sight surprising element is what Marx adds immediately after when he precises that he meant no sectarian name at all either communistic or over. How come Marx explicitly dissuaded a member of the IWMA from calling a constituent part of the organization communistic? How come he labeled the adjective communistic as sectarian? Obviously, Marx has no intention of turning his back to communism in any way. What is at stake is rather to distinguish between the sectarian use of the word and the revolutionary practice of the thing, as it can be implemented inside a real class movement. Marx intends to show that both do not necessarily tolly and that, on the contrary, there are situations in which the name communistic directly contravenes to a communist practice in the strict sense of the word. In a way, nothing could be further from the strategy of the party inside the party developed in the Manifesto of 1848, since the point is to treat every structure which would try to promote a specifically communist point of view inside the organization of the IWMA as sectarian. Without for all that putting all socialist trends at the same level, Marx considers that it is inevitable that, quote, the movement reflects itself in the heads in the most diversified forms, more or less fantastical, more or less adequate. The progress of communist ideas inside the class movement cannot go through the constitution of an organized tendency relying on a purely doctrinaire basis, whether inside or outside the working class party. In Marx's eyes, the real communists are those who, because they, quote, interpret best the hidden sense of the class struggle going on before our eyes do not describe communism as a distinct and predefined political option for which the working class movement should pronounce itself and are the last to commit the blunder of fostering sectarianism. From this point of view, 
the resolution number 23 of the London Conference of the IWMA of September 1871 um, constitute the, com the culmination of the reflection developed one year before in this context. By forbidding the sections of the IWMA to acquire sectarian names, um, the resolution text obviously referred to the discussion of the spring 1870, and so far as the names positivists, mutualists, collectivists, communists, etc., were prohibited. The nature of the danger was then clearly pointed out. It must be avoided at all costs that separatist bodies be formed, pretending to accomplish special missions different from the common purposes of the association. Henceforth, it is quite understandable that in Marx's eyes, the fight against sectarian regression inside the IWMA notably in the context of the conflict with Bakunin and his followers, largely consisted in rejecting every logical faction which would try to substitute doctrinaire and particularistic attempts for the general principle of the class organization. So I come now to my conclusion uh, in the last minutes I, I still have. Um, and deniably, Marx's new theory of the party, developed from the middle of the 1860s, includes, to some extent, self-criticism. Admittedly, the concept of sect elaborated in this context is not fit to characterize the organization form he advocated himself at the time of the Communist League, but it seems clear that every attempt to reactivate the strategy of the party inside the party would infallibly come close to being sectarian. Such an assessment is easily understandable. The new theory of the class party does not only contain a general reflection on the appropriate organization modalities of the working class, but also makes a diagnosis concerning the historical period in which it takes place. The transformation of the theory of the party corresponds to a new era which must be taken not off, without for all that condemning earlier attempts which sometimes were of relevance at their own time. Besides, it is interesting to note that the distinction between party and sect elaborated from the middle of the 1860s does not lead Marx to deny sects any relevance in the tide of history, even if this organization form is described as inadequate. From this point of view, the fate of sects is the same as their instigators, that is, utopians. There were pioneers in the past, but they are doomed to become reactionary as soon as the working class movement has shown his ability to um, conquer his own emancipation. The analogy drawn by Marx and Engels in fictitious splits in the International in March 1872 shows it clearly. Sects are described as a characteristic phenomenon of quote, the infancy of the proletarian movement, just as astrology and alchemy are the infancy of science. The sect reflects to the party the very image of its own past. Furthermore, just like research is carried out by alchemists in regard to chemists, it seems possible to claim that the action of the sect had a paradoxical effect. It contributed unintentionally to the development of the mass organization of the proletariat in which it was not involved at all. On that matter, 
Marx wrote in his article, Political Indifferentism of 1873, that we cannot repudiate the patriarchs of socialism, just as chemists cannot repudiate their forebears, the alchemists, even if we must avoid lapsing into their mistakes. All the things being, uh, being equal, the same is true of the strategy of the party inside the party in the at the time of the Communist League. Unsuitable for the new situation, it was nonetheless justified in the context of the end of the 1840s. Finally, in his letter to Friedrich Bolte of November the 23rd of 1871, Marx came to the idea that the development of socialist sectarianism and that of the real labor movement always stand in indirect proportion to each other. The main lesson he seems to have drawn from this diagnosis concerns the necessity of breaking with an excessive form of political voluntarism. Communist practice is not destined to quicken artificially the spontaneous process of self-organization of the proletariat, but to be part of it and to follow its pace. In the fourth annual report of the General Council of the IWMA, written in 1868, Marx declares that the international has not been hatched by a sect or a theory, but is the spontaneous growth of the proletarian movement, which is the offspring of the natural and irrepressible tendencies of modern society. The botanical metaphor extending in the German version with the use of the term greenhouse, hype house, uh, is meaningful. Comparing sectarianism to greenhouse cultivation, Marx likens it to a form on, of interventionism, which does not have respect for the specific dynamics of the working class movement. Just like the greenhouse, which is the expression of the hope of being exempt from the natural cycle punctuated by the seasons, the sect embodies the vain attempt to give birth to an organization of the proletariat ex nihilo by sheer force of a theory regarded as capable of putting an end to the contradictions of the present time. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, what I said was understandable despite my English. And I will be uh, very happy to uh, discuss with you and answer to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation on the change of Marx party theory. Is a detailed review of Marx and Engels literature. <clears throat> he examined the changes in the party theory from Marx and Engels writings in the 1840s, especially the Communist Manifesto to Marx's new position in the 18, 1860s and the new political situation emerge, emerged from the perspective of the communist party and the working class party. Now, anyone who has any question or discussion on the presentation, please raise your hand or let me know via chat. Yes, Professor Zarenka. Yes, Jean, that was very interesting talk. 
but I have some questions. The quote you made from Engels in 18, 1889, um, sound, I mean, I'm just being direct, sounds like a Leninist quote to me. It sounds like a Leninist quote. Um, and I can make a case that there is a continuity between Engels, Plekhanov, and Lenin that we don't need to discuss today. Uh, but on the other hand, when you went back to Marx in 1870, 71, 72, even 1870, it didn't seem Leninist. Um, so is there a separation in your thought between Engels and Marx later in, in their lives or not? Uh, thank you very much for your question. Um, it's it's uh, it's a quite difficult question actually because um, on the one hand, uh, as I, as I said, I think that uh, what Engels said in eighteen eighty nine is just like a, a, a sort of uh, synthesis of the position uh, defended by Marx and Engels in the in the at the beginning of the 1870s, for for instance, in 1871 in London, in the conference in the, um, the conference of the the IWMA, um, and I, I I don't think that there is a, a significant gap between the text. Of, uh, of the 1870s and this uh, later text of Engels. However, uh, uh, it's, it is true that the, the formulation that Engels gave uh, a few years later um, could, could sound, uh, uh, as you said, uh, a little more Leninist than, um, than, than before, even if, of course, uh, the, the theory of the party uh, uh, drawn up by Lenin is uh, only uh, elaborated um, um, afterwards. Uh, but uh, um, to be honest, uh, I um, specifically uh, worked on Marx's conception of the party uh, until uh, his death. And uh, I used Engels's text too, but I think that Engels's text, written after Marx's death uh, in the uh, in, in the eighties and in the nineties, are um, related to a new context, uh, to a new context, and I think it has to be. Um, um, studied precisely in this context. So I, I think it is possible that there are some modifications, some, some, some little modifications after Marx's death in, in, in Engels's mind, it, it is possible. Uh, however, I, I, at, at this stage, uh, I mean, I, I did not make, uh, as I said, a, a, a specific study on Engels' uh, later late text. I don't think that there is a significant gap between what uh, he writes, may, for instance, in 1889, and what uh, Marx and Engels wrote in in the 1870s. I think that the gap is earlier. The gap is in is between the, the text of the 1840s on the one hand and the text uh, of the uh, second, se second half of the 1860s and the text of the 1870s. Uh, that, that's how I see things. But if you have uh, elements uh, um, in, 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 this, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this regard, I, I would be very happy to, 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 to have them because it's, I think it's a very interesting question. So thank you very much.
Well, if no one else has a question, I can ask a second question. <laughs> um, what? I'm a little bit fuzzy in my head. Um, what is the role of a, a quote communist, a Marxist quote? Let's just say a, a Marxist as in Marx, not a Marxist self-labeled. Um, what is, how do they, how should we articulate ourselves to the working class? Um, um, I, I mean, we don't want to, we don't want to, sec, we don't want sectarianism, but we want to take a position, I guess, um, in the interest of the working class. So I'm a little bit, I'm just a little bit confused. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure that I uh, uh, properly understood your question, but maybe you, you will, uh, you, you will tell me if, if I, if I, uh, I got you wrong, but um, I think this, this question of the relationship between the, the, the working, the, the position of communist or of Marxists, uh, as you said, uh, and the, the working class is a, a very difficult uh, question because, uh, as you said, we, we don't want sectarianism, but the communists are, have to um, promote a specific uh, point of view. Uh, and it's this, this articulation is uh, to, to my opinion, it's the, the, the core of this uh, conception of the party, which we, which we find in Marxist texts, because um, I, I think that the, the, the concept of sect was a way in Marx's head to, um, to, 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 to find out a new relationship between um, the, the 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 communists and the working class, um, it it was it was a way to find out a new relationship, uh, which which would reject, uh, like like I, like I said, the preconceived recipes or or something like that, uh, the 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 the. Um, the enlightened uh, part of the of the of the movement, and I think when we when we uh, take a look at the at the texts uh, which uh, we have, uh, uh, for instance, the, the reports or the, the 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 minutes of the General Council of the IWMA, uh, the, the 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 letters between Marx and the the. Um, the, the, so the German Social Democrats, we can see that uh, the, the, the kind of relationship he tried to, um, to create uh, with the working class movement was something complex. It was not just, okay, I have uh, the, uh, I know the truth and I will give you the truth because I, I, I am a scientist okay. and I know. Uh, you, you, you know what I mean, and yeah. I think the the way Marx uh, uh, tried to 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 make a distinction between party and sect was a way to to think this new relationship. Uh, we don't want a sect. That means we don't want this kind of relationship that uh, uh, comes from above and 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 where uh, the 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 theoretician knows uh, better than the working class movement what the working class movement has to do. I think it's it's the kind of uh, of problem Marx tried to 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 work out in the in the in the last uh, in the two last decades of his life. I think it was a very important uh, question for him, and I think this new conception of the party was a way to. Um, to, to, to deal with this problem. I don't know if it was clear and okay. if it uh, was That's a, okay. Uh, Thanks. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, John, oh, thank you very much. Uh, great talk. Yeah, I learned it very much. And you argue that uh, uh, there is a, a, a important uh, development in uh, Marx, uh, Marx's conception of party uh, is uh, after 1860s. It, you argue that uh, that is the development from the concept of party presented in 1848 in the manifesto of the Communist Party. And you, so it looks that you, you argue that Marx uh, abandoned uh, the uh, concept of the Communist Party and it's uh, more, uh, more or less it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, argued for the is the is the broad is the working class working class party. So uh, and my question is that the so you uh, you the described Marx's concept of a party in the uh, Communist Manifesto as a model of a party inside party. Party inside party, uh, and and also the poor is uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, liken, likens is to the uh, Leninist party. Leninist is uh, uh, vanguard party, uh, but uh, I am wondering that uh, so as you as you, we know, uh, Lenin is uh, prohibited uh, the faction. Uh, in the party uh, after the uh, 1920 is uh, after the new uh, end of the uh, uh, end of the is a uh, uh, civil a civil war is so uh, after the end of the war communism mm. and we all know that uh, that uh, is the suppression or prohibition of the uh, organization of uh, uh, faction inside the party continued and is uh, continued in the Stalinist era. So, but I, I think in the uh, Marx concept of a, a party in the Communist Manifesto is uh, as you uh, described it as the uh, party inside the party is. Uh, it could be interpreted as uh, as a, is a freedom freedom of organization of factions or freedom of diverse uh, diverse approaches opinions in the party. So, in that respect, I think uh, uh, Marx's concept of party uh, even in the uh, Communist Manifesto is uh, far superior than Leninist Vanguard Party or Stalinist Party. So uh, I, I also think that that is, that is the freedom of opinions or freedom of the diverse uh, factions or freedom of organization of uh, uh, factions uh, is uh, uh, we can, uh, I think, it's, that uh, is a still that still has some relevance uh, for even uh, in the today's is a political today's uh, left politics. So, what do you think? Thank you very much. That's it's it's a very interesting uh, uh, question, and and I think this. Um, th th this this problem is very uh, is very relevant. Um, I would say two things. Uh, it's it's true that the um, the, the the idea of uh, of the of the Communist Party in the eighteen uh, in the eighteen forties and especially in eighteen forty eight has to be seen as a party inside the party and. Um, and besides, I I, I did not uh, uh, find I did not find that myself. Um, um, there there was a, a very interesting book from Mikhail Levy, uh, 
um, about the, the theory of revolution on, on in the young Marx and Mikhail Levy uh, uh, has um, shown it uh, uh, before me, uh, and I, I agree with him on on this uh, on this point. Um, regarding your question about uh, factions, uh, prohibition of factions on the one hand, and freedom of opinion on the other hand. Uh, I would say two things. Uh, these two questions can, of course, be related to, to one another, but they are not exactly the same question. Um, I, I think in, uh, in Marx's conception of the party, of course, there is in the, four, in the 1840s, but also in the 1860s, freedom of opinion. That, that, that is obvious. Uh, there is freedom of opinion, and it's it's very important that there uh, uh, remain freedom of opinion inside the, the 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 party. That that's that's not even a question. It's it's just obvious. Um, but the 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 the, the question uh, of factions is not really the same question because on the one hand, uh, in the eighteen forties. Um, of course, Marx says we, we have a part. Uh, we can say that in, in Marx's eyes, the communists are a party inside the party. But the Communist Party, which is inside the working class party, uh, it's not like a faction in a, in a constituted party. Uh, it's it's something different because the working class party, uh, when when he says uh, the working class party in England, it is Chartism. We can see, of course, that it's not Chartism, it's just like a movement. It's not a, 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 a constituted form of organization with congresses or what, what, uh, whatever you want. Um, the, 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 so, of course, there, there, there is a freedom of, uh, of, of opinion. And I don't even think that you can, you can regard it as a, it, the communist as a faction because uh, a faction would mean that there is a, um, um, a definite line, a definite political line of the working class party, and there is inside uh, this this party a, a different line, which is the, the line of the communists. But I don't think it's it, it, it functions like that because in at the end of the 1840s, the 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 working class parties, uh, as Marx uh, conceived them. They are not uh, uh, structured organizations uh, like like in the um, in the decades afterwards. So I think the problem of the faction emerges uh, in 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 the um, in the uh, in the period afterwards uh, in the in the eighteen sixties and especially in the context of the IWMA uh, and. Of course, there, there is a freedom of opinion, and there are debates uh, on the, uh, in the congresses, in the general council. Uh, that, that, that's um, uh, of course uh, it, it's it's true. The question is: Does it mean this is freedom of opinion? Does it mean that we can allow um, uh, the existence of a of an organized faction inside? The organization, the organization, which would have specific goals, different uh, specific goals. That means uh, different from the general goals of the IWMA, and that 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 is a different question from the question of uh, do we have freedom of opinion. But these are two separate questions, and I think Marx in the eighteen seventies. Especially in the context uh, of the conflict with Bakunin, Marx answers: Yes, uh, we 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 must have freedom of opinion, but no, uh, we cannot have factions which would have specific goals, which would be different from the general goals of the IWMA. So I think that's the way Marx um, tries to, to to solve this problem in the context of the 1870s, but. Um, the, the context is very different from that of the um, of the of the eighteen forties because the IWMA is not a working class party in the 
in the same sense that uh, as um, I don't know, Chartism was a, a working class party. The IWMA is a structured organization with, with uh, rules, with uh, congresses uh, almost every year. Uh, it's it's uh, it's um, we cannot compare the 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 um, the, 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 the the two working class parties on on this regard. So that's I, I think that's the point, and that's why Marx says uh, we don't want that uh, the sections uh, uh, give themselves specific uh, goals, specific names. That, that I think that's that's why Marx says that in this context. But I don't know if it was clear, but that's what that's how I would uh, re reformulate. The, the, the question. Any more question or discussion? If we don't have any further questions or discussions, that's it for today's seminar. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Get the, get the end. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you okay. very much for your attention. I was very happy to be here today. Good morning or good evening. <laughs>